everybody. Welcome to Weighing In with Andy Hamilton and David Mirakatani. I'm Andy Hamilton, coming to you from Cedar Falls, Iowa, joined on the phone by David Mirakatani down in St. Louis. We've both been on the road here the last couple of weeks. Back after a week off last week, the uh, normal recording date fell on the 4th of July. David and I both had a couple things going on, so we took a week off. I've been out at uh, the uh, Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, taking in USA Wrestling World Team Training Camp. David has been out in Cleveland. We're back, though. David, welcome back. Thanks, man. Missed talking to you last week, but I saw a lot of the stuff you're putting out online. It looked like a great trip. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was like a kid in a candy store out watching uh, training camp for a couple <laughs> of days. A lot of fun out there. I think anybody that uh, loves wrestling would have felt the same way. Just uh, you know, out there in like eight, nine, ten hours goes by like forty-five minutes. So it's a lot of fun. Yeah. David, how about yeah. you? Where you know? I guess first of all, why don't you uh, fill us in a little bit on on your travels? I went to Where's Cleveland. Gonna... I went to Cleveland. To, uh, obviously, I think everybody knows the NCAs are up there, and uh, I met with Coach Tahura from Cleveland State University, and uh, happy to announce that. He and uh, the Extreme Couture GI Foundation and myself are going to partner up and uh, run the, the Ohio Border Brawl there next year. So it'll be Ohio against Pennsylvania, Michigan, Indiana, West Virginia, and Kentucky. Uh, I looked at uh, a couple of the sources, and it looks like 25 of the top 100 seniors in the country will be eligible for that meet. So I, I think there'll be some great wrestling. So I got a chance to... You know, I've been talking to Coach for about a month and a half on the phone, got a chance to shake his hand, shot an interview with him, got to see the wrestling room, got to see where we're going to hold it, um, met with some great wrestling people over there afterwards for the after party, uh, just a bunch of stuff like that. And we also set up the Ultimate Fantasy Challenge while we were up there. And then uh, I I was taken around for the day by a guy in Gus Seiko from Defense So Two awesome guys, you know, they were, you know, Gus was a really good wrestler, uh, St. Edwards grad, had some injuries in college, but was a stud for Virginia. Those guys couldn't have been nicer. Got to see their facility and uh, do an interview with them. And they were kind enough to take me to St. Edwards and meet with Coach Urbis and see the wrestling room. And if you're a wrestling nerd uh, like I am, and I, I probably think it's probably fair to say you are, if that room is that you just feel the history when you walk into the room. It's really incredible. Well, tell us about it, man. What, uh, take us inside the room as, as much as you can from a verbal standpoint. Yeah, so you walk in, and, you know, they, I went in with the Seikos and a buddy of mine who's helping me run Ultimate Fantasy Wrestling Challenge, and they took us to Coach Urbis's office, and he couldn't be a nicer guy. Um, you know, great storyteller was, you know, telling us stories about how, you know, Gus, won a state title with a broken hand and that he wouldn't see the doctor because he knew if that happened, then, you know, he wouldn't be released. And they took a ligament out of one part of his body and put it in his hand. Then we go in the wrestling room and it's, it's probably about three mats, but it's set up more like a rectangle where it's two mats. And then the third mat is cut in half so, and then stacked together. And they've got, the full-size bracket of every state title that's come out of that place since 1959. Wow. Around the lower level. Yeah, and it's just a ton of them. And they're really cool. They're, they're uh, in calligraphy, and they're, in, they're glass, and they're matted, and really cool wood frames. And when, you know, if you're a history nerd, you see all the names that were in there, and it's unbelievable. So that would be enough. But they ran out of room. So they had to go up the second level, which is still in the wrestling room. They have like this really steep banked track in there. It's not, you know, it's probably like 20 laps is a mile or something like that. And they have more brackets going around there. And in one corner, they have all the brackets of the NCAA champions they've had, starting with uh, Heffernan, and the most recent one is Dean Heil. Uh, Ryan Bertine was in there. I don't want to slide everybody, but I don't remember every name. But, they, you know, they have four-time state champs there, like Eddie Jane. and I mean, just Heil was a four-timer. Uh, and then they also have a corner with all the Fargo brackets. Uh, only, And they have the old ones, the old boards where it was lines, right? It was like 120 names. And, you know, you just kept wrestling until, you know, it narrowed down to four guys. And 
just some amazing names in there. Um, it, it, this, the history of it is unbelievable. Um, you know, I just had Gene Mills on Matt Chat, and uh, Coach Hervis told me a great story about Gene Mills, about you know his high half series and how he taught it. Just they had hosted the Ohio training camp for about 20 years for the cadets or juniors. I think it's a place like, you know, you mentioned how eight hours felt like 45 minutes in uh, Colorado Springs. I, I think this this is another one of those places like that. I mean, obviously, it's not the same level, but just you could just sit there and soak it up. And it was, you know, coached in the interview. And, uh, you know, I'm, I just got back, but I'm going to send that to you guys so we can put it up on the site. But really just one of the really good guys, one of the – great stories I got from Gus Seiko when we left talking about what kind of man Coach Urbis is. Uh, he said that Urbis had promised a guy one year that he would fill in for him and call him bingo, uh, you know, calling out the numbers. And what he didn't realize was that he, he committed to that right in the middle of Fargo. So <laughs> Coach, Coach Urbis drives 18 hours to Fargo, coaches the first two days drives 18 hours back so he can keep his commitment to calling bingo, drives 18 hours back out to coach the rest of Fargo, and drives 18 hours back when it's over. <laughs> and, I, you know, I think there's a lot of guys like this, and I don't want to say just guys, there's a lot of people like this in our sport that are just unbelievable people and don't, you know, coach would never have told me that story. You know, that, that's how, you know, he's not that kind of guy. I mean, when I interview him, every time I ask him a question, he deflected and talked about his assistant coaches and the kids. And you see that more and more. I mean, you've interviewed guys for years. I've been doing this almost a year now. And you see that more and more that the really, really great ones don't take any credit. And uh, he's the kind of guy that if you had a son, you know, or a daughter, you'd, you'd be honored and you'd feel really, really good about you know, your kid wrestling for that guy. Just the guy just, he sweats class and integrity. It's just, he's a very impressive dude. Yeah. I had a chance to speak to coach Urbis uh, back in December leading up to the clash. Did a, uh, probably about a five minute podcast, five to seven minute podcast interview with him, just preview on the clash. And, uh, you know, everything you just said is consistent with, with the impression that I, that I got from, from coach Urbis as well. So, David, uh, you know, moving on a little bit here, we got, um, you know, lots happened in the wrestling world since um, since the last time we recorded for right. uh, National Duels. Uh, you you mentioned that on the show here, and, and then the story kind of blew up a little bit, uh, but uh, National Duels not going to happen in 2018. Tyler Graff to the Southeast Regional Training Center. Joe Cologne is headed to Fresno State to become the volunteer assistant there. Iowa picked up a couple big commitments. Pat Lugo is on the move from Edinburgh. And Tony Cassiope has uh, backed out of his commitment to Northwestern. He's going to become a Hawkeye. Uh, Nick Ramo to Arizona State. So the Sun Devils getting another top recruit. And, of course, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I, I went out to the Olympic Training Center. A lot of cool stuff happening out there last week. Where do you want to go? Let's start with OTC. I saw a couple of your interviews. Uh, I mean, I guess my first question I have, just as a Missouri guy, is how did Jaden look out there? Well, he is, uh, in, in speaking to him last week, he was hoping to get cleared over the weekend and uh, get back to being, um, you know, full throttle ahead for, for Paris. Uh, he was doing some drilling stuff. Uh, the day, the first day I was there, he was working on some parterre stuff with Terry Brands. There's a photo of that on uh, Track Wrestling, uh, Track Wrestling's Twitter account. Just a, a snapshot that I took out there of, of Terry working on top with him, which was, you know, I think one of the things that's really cool about this is is just you know you, you can throw out the college uh, allegiances when you get yeah. out into that room and and. Uh, Second day I'm there, it's Terry Brands and, and Thomas Gilman working with Jason Nolf. You know, Jason Nolf oh, wow. and Thomas That's Gilman cool. working, uh, you know, some part hair stuff. Um, so, so um, you know, it's really cool to see guys from different schools interacting. And, and 
you know, you, you get to the, to that point, it's all about the United States and and becoming the best wrestler you can be for the United States. And and uh, so so that was pretty cool. Um, you know, I think some of the other things that uh, uh, you know that really caught my attention. Uh, the second day I was there, um, Friday, I think it was Friday morning. Yeah, it would have been Friday morning. Uh, Jordan Burroughs, the most accomplished guy in the entire room, is all ears, um, asking questions, working with Coleman Scott and Zane Rutherford on some front headlock stuff. And, uh, you know, you're talking about about a guy that's four-time World Olympic medalist that, that when he won gold, um, he was a teammate with Coleman Scott. And right. uh, I, I think that that speaks – volumes about a couple things there. Number one, um, Jordan's willingness to to listen and learn and how coachable he is and, and how receptive he is to adding from anybody that he can get uh, advice from or tips from that, that might be able to help him. Uh, and, and number two, I think that that also speaks volumes about, uh, you know, how much respect he has for Coleman Scott and, and, and his technical expertise. So that. That to me was really cool. Um, another uh, big takeaway I had was uh, watching the young guys out there not taking a back seat at all. And Gable Stevenson wrestling a um, uh, practice match with Nick Wisdowski, and it was it was a barn burner. Uh, it really? was back Close. and forth. It was back and forth. It was competitive and. I walked away thinking, man, this guy is going to be a factor <laughs> on the senior level in a hurry. And, and, and also, just wondering, how in the hell are high school kids going to contend with this guy next year? It's not going to be fun for high school heavyweights up in Minnesota. Not that it was, yeah. you know, in the, the past couple of years, but, uh, man, this guy is a handful right now. And um, and also, David Carr, right? You know, I looked over out of the corner of my eye, saw David Carr blast Dublin Nolf for a takedown, and and you know, over time, those the, you know the more experienced guys are are gonna win out. Um, you know, they're more seasoned, they're you know more mature. Um, you know, have a few more tricks in the bag, and they're physically stronger too. But uh, to see these young guys in there, um, you know, in there competing to get scores and not taking a back seat, I, you know, it, it also um, it also speaks to the strength of USA wrestling from an age division standpoint and, and, you know, what is going on at the cadet and junior level. You know, I'm not sure we've ever seen this kind of talent and depth right. that we have yeah. right now as a country. And it bodes well for the United States for the next decade and beyond because they're, you know, we're, we're seeing guys bringing home freestyle medals now on a consistent basis and, and, you know, Jordan, four titles. Kyle Snyder, two titles. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of medal contenders on this roster going to Paris, but uh, but also there's a wave of of good young talent behind them, and uh, I, I think it bodes bodes well for a bright future for the United States. So so that was another thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, you know, and then just go ahead, David. No, just to jump in. You talk about the age level stuff, and I'm friends with Sean Charles on Facebook, and he just got back from coaching one of those teams, and he posted 29 kids competed, 29 medalists for the United States, and you know all the different styles and cadets. And, yeah, Pan Am you know, cadets. Yep. Yeah, Pan Am cadets, and it, it, you know, to me, it, it brings me back to the conversation that I had with Cody Bickley that they're really, really really pushing for these, you know, age level guys, you know, to create the best structure possible for these kids to succeed. And, you know, he's, you can tell he's a, he's a numbers guy. He's a high energy guy. And, you know, the, the data that, you know, like 29 for 29, but just what you're saying, just the eyeball test, right? Like, you know, who knows who won the match between Stevenson and Gliz, but you know, like, Hey, it wouldn't be shocking to see this guy in the semis of the world trials or the Olympic trials in 2020. You know, it, it is crazy how much, how good these guys are getting so soon. And, you know, I'm, I'm friends with Derek Fix, Dayton's dad. And he talked to me about how Dayton's already wrestled in eight or nine countries, you know, before he's wrestled a college match. I mean, 
it, it's it's super impressive. You know, I, I would have loved to have been, uh, you know, a fly on your backpack and just got to sit around and watch for a couple of days. One of my ex wrestlers was up there coaching Cornell Robinson, and he was sending me pictures of you know the different guys wrestling and who he's having dinner with. And yeah, I think if you love wrestling, it's kind of a kid in a candy store kind of week for you. Yeah, absolutely. And and one of the other things that uh, you know to follow in your footsteps and, and some of the points you're making here. Um, one of the things that's really cool to me is is seeing these guys like hanging out after practice, like practice ends and these guys are in there talking shop. They're teaching each other extra stuff. And, you know, it's like nobody was in a real hurry to get out of the practice room and get out of there. You know? <laughs> That's cool. and, and so, yeah. And so the younger guys pick up on that and you think about like how valuable this is for the younger guys that are out there and seeing um, like w- what makes Jordan Burroughs, Jordan Burroughs and Kyle Snyder, what makes him and, um, you know, basically learning how to be a pro at, at 16, 17 years old. And, 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 you know, you just don't see this. And, you know, I, to my knowledge, I, I don't know that, you know, there are a lot of 16 and 17 year old high school basketball players playing pickup games with LeBron. Uh, you know, you're probably not going to yeah. find high school, high school wideouts trying to, you know, catch passes on NFL DBs. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that that it's something that can really accelerate the uh, the, the growth of some of these young guys. And you mentioned 29 for 29 at the Pan Am Cadets, and and that's just like, like like taking nothing away from the teams that that the United States sent down there, but there are right. dozens and dozens of other wrestlers um, around the country that that are on par, or you know, or or have bigger resumes or more accomplished. Than, than the, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, then, no doubt. Then, then the ones, then the ones that the United States sent down there, and and you know that again, that's no knock on the on the teams that the United States sent, but no, more but facts a, are facts. Yeah, but more an indication of just the incredible level of depth in this country right now, and and how those younger ages are coming along faster than ever before. For sure, and yeah, I mean, you know, you and I saw each other in Lincoln, and I got a chance to coach Seve and Severado in the freestyle trials and he lost to Malik Heinzelman, but he actually just got selected to the Greco team because the guy he'd lost to in the finals there has some concussions. And, you know, none of those kids went to Pan Am just at that one weight class and they're still meddling. So you're right. The depth of the USA. And, you know, I think the point you said is really, really well taken, you know, like, you know, the football analogy, like, you know, I'm the number one wide receiver in America. Well, I, I'm not running, you know, wide out, you know, running out patterns against the number one D-back in the NFL. It just doesn't happen that way. And, you know, I was lucky enough to wrestle with college guys when I was like 12 or 13. And that is, I think, how when you're the young guy in the room, how you jump levels. You know, you, you get your rear end kicked, you take your beatings, you know. But like you said, you learn how to be a professional. You learn how to, you know, basically act right. And it is really interesting how many of these guys and you interviewed a lot of them but like Abel Stevenson seems like a really humble kid you know Dayton Fix is a really quiet humble kid you know and I'm just I'm not seeing any of these other guys aren't I think almost they all are and you don't see some of the mouthiness with some of these guys that you do in other sports and it's cool to see these wrestlers giving back and you know a guy like Burroughs gives back so much and then you know he could be a guy that says well I did better at the Olympics than Coleman Scott so what could I possibly learn from him like you're saying, he's the opposite. You know, he's, you know, show me, Coleman, show me, show me how to get better. And when Jordan Burroughs is saying, show me how to get better, Kyle Snyder, show me how to get better, everybody else pretty much better check their ego at the door. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, while we're on this topic, all of uh, those interviews, or well, I shouldn't say all of them, but but most of the interviews from the uh, World Team Training Camp are up on trackwrestling.com. You can find those. We're going to have a 24-part profile series on all of the men's freestyle, women's freestyle, and Greco-Roman world team members. That'll be kicking off here later this month. Uh, but also, uh, you know, for that, I had a chance to uh, spend about 35 minutes with Jordan Burroughs and uh, be on the lookout for that here in the next month. Um, you Sweet. Know, story That's and interview nice. from that. that uh, 
You know, the, the best thing about interviewing Jordan, and I've always said that, that the best interviews aren't interviews, they're conversations, and everything with Jordan Burroughs is a conversation. And, uh, you know, just, just a lot of fun to get to talk to him about, uh, you know, what's going on right now in his career and, you know, try to bounce back from, uh, you know, in his words, the embarrassment that he felt coming out of Rio. Um, you know, just a lot of cool stuff from that interview and, and uh, looking forward to getting that out to the public here sometime in the next month. So so be on the lookout for that. David, the last Here's- time that we were – with that, go ahead. Now, I say you're as good as it gets uh, in terms of making interviews feel conversational, and it's it's one of the things I've tried to steal from you doing match chat. And I do think that when it feels conversational, it's better for the listener, and it's even better for the guys like us that are fortunate enough to get to do them. Yeah, absolutely. And that was a lot of fun. You know, the interview with Jaden Cox out there at the, at the Olympic Training Center was, you know, felt like the same way. Just a just a free flowing conversation and. You know, Jaden talking about, uh, you know, the recovery from the knee injury in Lincoln and what he's been going through and what he'll be going through here with uh, rehab over the course of the next few weeks and uh, getting ready for Paris, getting cranked up for that. Pretty interesting stuff to me. So, I, I you know, I enjoyed every minute that I was on the, the <laughs> campus out there at the Olympic Training Center and, and can't wait to get back there. So, the only sure. downside, the only downside to it was, uh, you know, just not ha- having more time, not having, you know, and not having the women's freestyle and Greco teams um, around on campus as much while I was out there. But I got a chance to talk to Matt Lindland uh, about a 25-minute interview that uh, is also up. You know, one of the things that's really unique about the Greco team, and I, I did a freelance story a couple of years ago for Win Magazine, and, and he talked about, like, all the team-building exercises that they did, you know, they, that they were climbing 14,000-foot uh, mountains, um, you know, going on on uh, some, some trips that are a little um, – that, that you wouldn't necessarily associate with, a you know, a, a USA wrestling team per se, but uh, just, just team building bonding experiences. And, uh, you know, he talks about uh, some of the whitewater rafting that those guys did out in, in Oregon. Um, it's, it's pretty cool stuff to me. So, so if you get a chance yeah. to check that one out, I, you know, go check it out. It's on trackwrestling.com. So David, last time we talked, uh, national duels was, um, something you mentioned that you had learned from John Smith and the story has since come out. Uh, that there will be no national duels in 2018. What was your initial yeah. reaction to hearing that? Well, I guess two parts. One is, you know, you're kind of sad, but two, I had talked to a bunch of people, you know, where they, you know, this Big Ten versus the world concept, and, you know, that the Big Ten had negotiated to hold it the first year, and then obviously they were the guests the second year. And when every everybody I talked to about it, from Mike Moyer to, you know, specific coaches, there wasn't one person that said, yeah, well, I'm pretty sure this is going to continue. Or, you know, I feel good they're going to have some iteration of this that's going to happen. And when you talk to 15 people and none of them have a plan, it's probably not going to happen. And so that's exactly what happened. Nothing. Uh, I think I told you I'm actually working on a national duels proposal that I'm going to run by smart guys like you, and then, you know, if it, if it makes sense to you, you know, send it to, to you know, the powers that be at track and ultimately the NWCA and see if it can work. But, you know, ultimately what it comes down to is no matter how much we want them to matter, duels don't in terms of, you know, coaches and athletes are judged on two weekends, the national qualifier and the national tournament. And until that changes, it's going to be hard to – it's hard to artificially make something important. The problem is duels are unbelievably important and awesome to growing the sport. And when I interviewed Coach Smith, you know, he talked about that. When you interview, you know, John Reeder, you know, some of what you – know, you've talked about what South Dakota State's doing and, you know, what Rutgers did at this football stadium and, you know, what Iowa did at the football stadium a couple of years ago. They're really crucial to growing the sport. We've got to figure out a way to make them matter enough that teams want to participate in them. And I'm working on something 
sometimes you just assume everybody else has got it figured out. And I love wrestling and I want to get back. So I'm going to throw my hand in the ring and try to come up with something. And even if it's not the solution, maybe it'll generate, maybe it'll be close enough to the solution that somebody can uh, tweak it. Because I mean, I remember like three or four years ago when in freestyle, when people were tied and nobody knew who was winning, like I literally called Gary Abbott and I go, why don't you guys put a dot or a circle or something next to the guy who's winning? And I don't know if it was my suggestion. I'm sure other people did too, but that changed. So now people know. And you have to make wrestling easily understandable if you want to get new fans. So uh, I'm saying it's not going to happen, you know, but I think it probably would obviously be the winner, you know, at least on paper right now it would be, you know, it looks like it would be Oklahoma State versus the winner of Penn State, Ohio State, if they'd kept the same format. You know, but there'll be some great duels next year. And, you know, honestly, if somebody said to you who won the national duels five years ago, you'd probably know because you're really smart. But I think less than 5% of the wrestling public would remember. So um, until we change that, it's probably not as big of a loss. If it, if sometimes Coach Urbis said, you know, without pain, there isn't progress. And I think that's maybe that's what this needs to happen. This needs to be painful and everybody wanting to grow from it and progress. Yeah. 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 And I don't know. I don't know that there will be pain over this deal. I really don't. Um, it'll be interesting to see next February. Does it feel like something's missing from not having a national dual championship? Maybe, maybe not though. You know, the one thing, uh, you know, to your point about, you know, it, it's gotta be worth more. Um, uh, yeah. I remember, I remember back, uh, I want to say 2011, you know, in, Late summer, I, I remember it was late August, and the conversation then was they were talking about doing away with the team point standings at the NCAA championships. I don't know if you remember this or not, but they were talking about do doing away with the yeah. team standings and making the national champion, crowning the national champion as whoever wins a dual, tur- you know, the dual tournament. Right. And and I felt like then, like that's probably not a path that they want to go down and um, (laughs) monkey with like the most successful um, event that they have right now. That's right. You know, it's it's a crown jewel. Why would you, why would you do anything to disrupt the most successful thing in the sport right now? And, uh, you know, so, so I was sitting there on like a Saturday night in late August and watching the NASCAR season unfold. And this was back before, before NASCAR changed its, its uh, playoff formula to what it is now. But, but at the time NASCAR had 36 races and um, the first 26 were the regu- regular season. And then the last 10 were the playoffs, the chase. And what they would do is like your, your point totals from the first 26 would get you into the final 10. And, and then, uh, um, you know, I think at the time it might have been 12 drivers getting in uh, to the last, you know, getting into the chase, getting into the playoff. And and I thought to myself, like, you know, if, if wrestling is determined to make duels matter more, why not do that? Why not come up with some kind of formula that, you know, basically you have to participate in the duels and you have to qualify through the duels to get into, you know, the team race for the national championship. And I don't know. You know, there's been a little bit of discussion about that since. I, you know, I wrote a piece afterward about that. And, and you know, I've heard people talk about that formula more so. Um, you know, I think my idea in the beginning was that, like, only the top eight or 16 teams in the dual standings would would uh, actually qualify for, uh, you know, the NCAA team race at the national tournament. I think actually – or, or get a head start on that. I think actually what they've talked about is, you know, some type of formula where 24 teams, this was kicked around at one point, 24 teams would get in to uh, get into the duels. And then based on your finish into the duels would be uh, X amount of points that you would go into the national tournament with. I haven't heard a whole lot of discussion about that since, but Tom Ryan did bring that up to me um, in a conversation that we had I think in uh, late January, early February, right before they were getting ready to wrestle at Iowa, we talked about that. And he thinks that uh, basically you've got to make the regular season dual meet matter 
because, you know, he, he even talked about it that night uh, after the Iowa-Ohio State duel where, you know, Kyle, Kyle Snyder was off wrestling, uh, I believe, at the Oregon, and, and Corey uh-huh. Clark sat out. Yeah. And, you know, if uh, national championship points are at stake, um, you know, you got to believe either. that Kyle, yeah. you know, Kyle Snyder and Corey Clark are going to be on the mat that night. So uh, there are a lot of smart people in the sport. There's no doubt about that. There are a lot of bright minds. And uh, I, I think that, um, you know, in your interview with John Smith, one of the points that, that he made is, you know, maybe this is what we need as a sport is, is to take a year off and basically sit there and examine the thing and figure out a good solution. Because right now, um, you know, we got, you know, we probably got, uh, if you could survey a dozen coaches, you might find a, d- a dozen different opinions on, on how this thing should be done. And, and uh, right now, I agree. Until, there's, until there's consensus, it's, it's going to be hard getting everybody to buy in the way that they need to buy in. 100% agree with all of that. And I do think, I mean, I've actually got an idea, and I probably will talk to you about it later on this week. But, yeah, it's 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 weird, right? Because, like, we talked about, you know, you and I have spoken about this numerous times on the air, that in tournaments your best guys matter, and in duels your worst guy matters. And, you know, I looked at the Penn State results in this past year, and Zane Rutherford was their top point scorer with 28 points. He would have been 17th as a team by himself. Him and Bo Nichols scored 55 and a half points. That would have put them 10th by themselves. Him, those two plus Jason Nolf scored 82 and a half points, which would have put them in sixth. And then those three plus Vincenzo Joseph scored a 105 and a half, which would have put them third, but really second, because now you're taking Penn State out of, you know, this is the new Penn State with just four guys. Obviously, if you had Mark Hall, they win. But even if you had Neville's, Actually, even if you just add Jimmy Gulliban, they win. So Zane, Nickel, Nolf, Vincenzo, and Gulliban win nationals. They they lose every dual meet. If that's their whole lineup. Like if they have those five and five forfeits, they lose every dual meet. So there has to be some happy medium in there on how they make that work. And, you know, I like I said, I, I literally played around with something a couple hours after we talked a couple weeks ago. I'm going to run it by you. Uh, you know, I think if you think it sounds good, then it's probably not dumb. And then, uh, you know, probably send it to you to run it up the flagpole to the right people and see how it works. But it's, uh, it's, they got to figure out a way to make it work. If you look at all the other sports that are popular, like NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, like you said, NASCAR, I mean, people say, well, everybody makes the playoffs in the NBA and in, in hockey. But one, it's not true. Only half of them do. And two, you have to, you know, you, you have to at least probably have at least a 500 record to get in. And, I mean, I remember my last two years in high school, I was undefeated, and all that got you was a number one seed at districts. I mean, it gets you nothing. You know, you, you do one dumb thing, slam a guy, and they default you out, or, you know, you lose your mind on the rough and you're done. So, it's, you know, none of those matches matter. And, you know, I heard somebody who's a friend of mine talk, and I said, you know, in high school, duels are even worse because, you know, if you're really good and I'm really good, and we the other two is a, a toss-up between the, our scrub against your scrub, in general, they'll just move them. They'll move the good guy out of the way, so it's just a push. You know, you pin our scrub, I pin your scrub, and then we'll let the other match decide it. So they've got to figure out a way to make this work because people want to see matchups. They want to see the best guys wrestle. And if we can see more of the best guys wrestle, it's going to grow the sport. And and that's, you know, I think the hard part is, like you said, 12 opinions, 12 different coaches, they're all looking at it the way they should, really, for what's best for my team and my job. Well, that's how they should look at it, but that's not how the sport needs to look at it. You know, they, somebody needs to be in charge that can herd the cattle together and say, look, this is what's best for the sport, even if it's a little bit of pain for your program. So hopefully somebody or maybe us can be involved in, as part of the solution. Yeah, I tell you what, man, I I look out uh, my front drive now uh, here in Cedar Falls, and, and I can see the Uni Dome. I'm like nine blocks away. I miss 
more than ever <laughs> right right now as this is going down. I miss the days of uh, you know mid January or, or second week of January, having that thing uh, in the Uni Dome and having all the divisions uh, yeah. under the same roof. I realized that that you know that that was flawed too, and in uh, you know ultimately. But it was cool. It was cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we wrestled One thing that. that we were in the finals. Yeah, it was really fun. You know, you're looking down the mat, and you know, Oklahoma State wrestling Iowa, and you're four mats over. You know, wrestling Iowa Central. I mean, it's pretty cool. So, yeah. Yeah, in front of you know, thirteen, fourteen thousand, or whatever it may be, it's got to be a pretty cool experience for everybody involved. But, uh, but I am glad to to see that uh, you know the multi divisional national duels will continue to go on. I got the yeah. chance to go out there in January and, and such a cool event out there and, uh, you know, so much good wrestling out there as well. So, um, you know, looking forward to at least having that in January and uh, hopefully at some point in time here in the not so distant future that uh, bright minds can get together, figure out a solution and, and get this thing rolling again and, and figure out the best uh, long-term play where, where we're not having to, uh, basically reinvent the format every year or figure out where on the calendar it needs to go or when and um, when on the calendar or where they want to put it. But uh, it just seems like, you know, we, we haven't been able to find that set formula uh, where it's been consistent for more than a couple of years uh, since, John, it, since it left, uh, since it left Cedar Falls. John Smith said something really interesting. He said, we need to stretch our postseason. And I asked him what he meant by that. And he said, you know, if you look at all the other college sports, and he didn't say this, but if you look at the pro sports, none of them are done in three days in one weekend. You know, I mean, if you look at the NFL, you know, there's wild card weekend and then divisional weekend and then championship weekend and then a weekend of hype and then the Super Bowl. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you know, every people that know sports, no, they're just, none of them are just one game like that, you know, one weekend like that. And so, that makes sense. Then it gets back to the other conversation. Okay, do you stay a one semester sport or do you stay a two semester sport? Do you become a one semester sport? You know, then if you stretch that, how does it affect where we can hold the nationals because of the conflict with NBA and NHL playoffs and what's best for the student athlete? Like a lot of people think they already wrestled too many matches. You know, if you stretch it, you give them more weight allowance. I mean, there's, that's the problem. There's every time you move one peg, you know, it affects three other things, you know, in, in the game of life, in the game of wrestling. But his point in a vacuum, for sure, is really well taken that, you know, it's there's not even that much buildup to it, right? Because, I mean, there's only like, you know, the big 10s in on Sunday, and then literally 10 days later is, well, 11 days later is Thursday morning, and you're wrestling. So there's really not enough time to hype it, you know, where if you could somehow figure out a way to stretch it, it would be better. So, anyway his two cents worth, which I agree with. Well, as we mentioned, uh, Tyler Graff to the Southeast Regional Training Center. Good get there for the Virginia Tech program. Yep. And Joe Colon heading out west to Fresno State. Uh, another good get uh, for Fresno State to have uh, have that guy on board out there and uh, supplementing uh, their regional training center. And good gets for Iowa in in terms of Pat Lugo making the jump from Edinburgh to joining the Hawkeyes. And as I mentioned, Tony Cassiope, heavyweight out of Illinois, backing out of his commitment to Northwestern, going to become a Hawkeye as well. Nick Ramo, stud uh, from New Jersey, going to head out west as well to Arizona State. David, out of that group, what uh, strikes you as the most interesting out of, of that uh, selection of personnel moves. I think it's tough for Northwestern, right? You know, like we've talked about this, there's no second place medals in recruiting, and now they're second on Cassiope and second on Beard, and that's really tough. Uh, you know, I, I had heard Lugo wasn't going to leave, and then, you know, we saw him at World Team Trials, and he's hanging around with Iowa, and obviously now he is going to leave, and, you know, that's great for them. I had talked to Coach Pritz a few days before the Ramo thing became public, and so, you know, he had told me that in confidentiality. And, and Ramo comes from Apex Wrestling Club with Damian Logan, who does an unbelievable job with his those guys out there. It really helps them find the best programs and the best fits. So, you know, I think, you know, I mean, 
recruiting's interesting, you know, no matter, you know, there's one winner and there's a bunch of losers. It's kind of like getting a prom date, you know. So, uh, I mean, I'm happy for all those programs, and uh, ASU continues to build. And, you know, they continue to recruit. You know, everybody thought they'd do really well out west. Well, it, it, they're showing that, you know, Zeke and Lee and Pendleton have long arms and they can go all over the country and get the best kids. Well, some, uh, some more news on the NCAA rule front. Uh, you know, our friends at IARussell.com pulled up uh, the rule changes today that uh, have been put in place. We talked about those back uh, in the spring. And, you know, as proposals, things were recommendations, and NCAA is putting these things into place for next season. David, can you give us a rundown of what uh, – you know, the big ones on the list are that are getting changed and, and your thoughts on them. I saw two that jumped out to me, and one of them I just saw as we were talking. So first one is Rule 3.14.3. It says, in the overtime tiebreaker, each wrestler will have the choice of either top, bottom, or neutral. Rationale, the current tiebreaker rule requires a choice of top or bottom only. This conflicts when injury timeouts are called and the wrestler loses his choice to his competitor, and referees must adhere to the injury timeout rule, which requires giving the choice of top, bottom, or neutral. Making this rule change will standardize choices and make it a top, bottom, or neutral selection in all instances throughout the match. I think that's really interesting. If you you know if you go the 3-2-2, two, two, then the 1, then the 30-30, then the 1, and then the 30, and if, you know, I know – that even if I ride you out the whole way, I'm going to lose because of riding time, I'm going to pick, you know, I'm, I'm going to, it's just going to change how, you know, when you pick down and when you pick neutral. I mean, you're obviously never going to pick top in that scenario, but that's interesting. Then the big one is the neutral situation. And you and I had spoken about this at Pete Mankiewicz, the referee we had on, and Mike Haggerty, the referee we had on, it all talked about this. So this rule is, numbered 4.2.3 and 4.2.4. It says, create a neutral danger zone takedown. When in the neutral position, the referee shall announce a neutral danger signal, parentheses NDS. Anytime a wrestler exposes their shoulders to the mat at an angle of 90 degrees or less. The danger zone utilizes near fall criteria, but replaces 45 degrees with 90 degrees. The NDS announcement shall occur anytime a wrestler is voluntarily or involuntarily in the neutral danger zone beyond reaction time and will continue until the wrestler is out of the danger zone or a takedown is awarded. The NDS is a verbal announcement of the word danger, followed by a verbal three count. If the referee reaches the third count and the wrestler is still in the danger zone, the opposing wrestler is awarded a takedown. And it says rationale, provides wrestlers a mechanism for which they can demonstrate control in these scramble situations. The implementation of the NDS will minimize stalemates and increase scoring opportunities. The NDS will also provide the referees rules backings for making difficult takedown control calls when, refer when wrestlers are on their back and traditional control concepts are not applicable. It's it's interesting because we had talked about this. You and I had talked about this, and myself and the refs had talked about this, that they needed to create a count. I never thought it would be three. That's really fast. Uh, but I also think this is really good for wrestling, right, because it's going to be more scoring. If Again, I think we're looking at it from how do we get more fans, and it's awfully hard to explain why one guy's on his back. It looks like he's on his back, but he's on top getting riding time. And you won't have to have that conversation for very long now because it'll change in three seconds. So I think it's good. I'm surprised that it happened so quickly, and I'm surprised that the count is only three counts. It'll be kind of like that step-out rule the first year where you'll see, you know, how people adjust to it. But uh, I don't know. What do you think about it? Yeah, I'm, uh, I like to see rules in place. For a while before I I uh, make too many firm judgments on it, but I think it's positive. Right. You know, I mean, there there are sometimes some some consequences that you you don't imagine yeah. until uh, you know you see them in action. But 
yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, to me, and this is opening a whole different can of worms, but I'm, I'm a big fan of freestyle. I really enjoy freestyle, and I think, uh, you know, any rules that, that, one, we can get into place that, you know, maybe, uh, and, and I don't want to see a full-scale switchover to that, but, uh, you know, if we can kind of blend the two together a little bit more, I think that's healthy. Uh, you know, I'd like to see more edge of the mat, uh, you know, type of stuff. I'd like to see a push out uh, put into place. But, uh, you know, because I think, I think, one, it helps the United States as a country, too. You know, but uh, that was one of the things. There was a lot of chatter about just this, you know, all the scrambles. And, and as you mentioned, guys on their back for extended periods of time, um, basically hanging on, just trying to get a, a stalemate. And and now you're, you're not going to your back and, and hanging on for a stalemate because you're giving up points, which which I think is is positive. And, and uh, let, let's uh, find a way to put some more points on the board too. And, and this, uh, anything that's going to increase the scoring and increase the activity, um, Generally, I'm I'm all for that. So excited to see, you know, a season of what it looks like and and what kind of uh, uh, data comes out of this in terms of what it does, maybe for scoring or, uh, you know, just just in terms of activity. I'm 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 really excited to see what it looks like. Yeah, me too. And the un, unintended consequences are always the interesting part, but. Again, I think if you're trying to just make wrestling more fan friendly and grow fans, this is a good step. So I'm glad they took it. I didn't see in the in that story anywhere in the st- stuff that was cut up, cut up. Is there anything in there about the headgear? You know, they're talking about making I, the headgear optional. I scrolled through this twice while we were talking. I don't see anything about headgear in here, and I don't see anything about beard in here. Uh, so, I saw something in there about facial hair that uh, was like a half inch oh, or something like here that. It is. Yeah, maximum half inch. Yep. yep. So, God only knows how they're going to measure that. But, you know, I guess that's good. And the guy that defend soap said it's a great rule because of the obvious things that you're opening your skin's up, your skin up to, to infection and stuff. So, yeah, I don't know how the headgear thing, you know, shook out. So it's, it'll apparently be it's not part of the uh, part of the discussion, or or, or they uh, tabled that thing for for the year. So anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, lots of uh, you know we say this every week, and and it's you know to the point now where where we can talk wrestling fifty two weeks a year, and we can break down events that are coming up uh, fifty two weeks a year, pretty much. Um, no exception this week. Fargo kicking off this weekend. Freestyle at the front end this year. Uh-huh. Uh, for the first time in a while, you know, at least in my memory, it's the first time freestyle kicked off Fargo. Uh, and then also Grand Prix Spain. We're going to have some of uh, the top American world team members going to be out in Spain competing at that. So keep an eye on that. We're getting down the wire, David. Uh, two weeks from Friday, I leave for Finland for the Junior World Championships. And then uh, I think our countdown to Paris is down to 39 days right now before the world championships, the senior level world championships get going over in Paris. So it's going to be exciting. Next couple months is going to be a lot of fun wrestling to watch. Anything else you have your eye on? Well, I had Wayne Boyd on. Uh, I interviewed him today. He'll come up tomorrow on uh, Matt Chat, And he, he mentioned that Titan Mercury has partnered up with Track Wrestling to show all those world championships at the various levels. So he's a, he's a super cool guy to talk to and, you know, never, uh, never at a loss for words, always has a great story. Um, big, you know, big proponent of growing wrestling. So, uh, yeah, he was fun. And then, uh, in a couple of weeks, um, I'm going to get Sammy Julian on who is, you know, I don't want to slight anybody else, but arguably the best freestyle referee, we have in America, and uh, I talked to him in uh, Tulsa about refereeing and, and, you know, how we may not be even looking at matches the right way, and uh, he's going to come on and, and give us his perspective, and, and for those people that don't know, he was the referee of the Jaden Cox-David Taylor final match of World Team Trials, so um, I'm really looking forward to talking to him about that and getting his perspective, you know, not only on that match, but just on 
the rules in general. And, you know, I think what you hear a lot from these referees are we may not agree with the rule, but it's our job to implement it. So yep. uh, those yep. those things are what's going on in, in, in my neck of the woods. Hey, before we sign off, you had Gene Mills last week on Matt Chat. What were some of the highlights <laughs> of that conversation? <laughs> I, he told me that when he went to the Olympic Training Center one year, that they did a measure, and of all the athletes that were there, there was like three deep at ten different weights and two different styles, like 60 guys, that he was the weakest guy pound for pound. But he also said that he had the highest cardio capacity, you know, which, you know, I, I believe if you watch this style. And uh, he said his argument was, well, I should be in the best shape. I don't have any muscles that the oxygen have to go to. So I thought that was really funny and uh, sort of scientifically accurate, but not something you would generally brag about. Um he told the story, I can't remember who was wrestling, how the first guy, the guy wrestled him, got the first takedown, he got the last takedown, and he would have lost if he hadn't scored the 25 points in between. Um, he's just a hammer of, of a guy. He tells a great story about wrestling uh, overseas in the Tbilisi tournament, and I, I don't want to ruin it, but people need to listen. In that story alone, like, I, I couldn't stop. I literally had to get it together, Andy, and I mean... Uh, you know, trying to follow after you and, and, we, and be a good journalist. I, I could have just laughed for about four minutes out loud. So um, he's just a terribly entertaining guy, re- very, uh, very self-deprecating. And uh, I think people forget how good he was. You know, he won to Blissey. You know, he was, you know, pretty clearly the best guy in the world the year we boycotted. And, you know, he talked about that and just, he just was very generous with his time and his stories. He wasn't guarded. Um, and I think you get these guys that are, you know, out of competing and they're a lot less guarded than the guys are in, you know, like the assistant coaches in season, they're not going to tell you their secrets because they're secrets for a reason. You know, these guys get out and they'll just kind of tell you everything. And the stories are just phenomenal. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's been a blessed couple of weeks interviewing, you know, John Smith and Randy Couture and, and Gene Mills and now Wayne Boyd. And, you know, it's, it's just been really fun. So. Um, you know, just trying to do my best for you guys, and they've been really fun guys to talk to. We appreciate it, David. It's been we my appreciate, pleasure. Uh, all your contributions to track wrestling. As I mentioned, we got a lot of cool stuff coming up here over the course of uh, the next couple months leading up to and coverage of the kid. First of all, the Junior World Championships, the Senior Level World Championships, and wrapping the thing up with Cadet World Championships. Uh, in September in Athens, Greece. And before you know it, we'll be uh, winding down from that and getting ready to crank it up again on the college side of things. So plenty of stuff on track wrestling right now. I have not even mentioned uh, the Blue Chip Recruiting Podcast with Eric Olinowski. Eric had Ohio State commit Jordan Decatur, a cadet world team member on, had a good discussion with him. So be sure to check that out. Eric will have some more stuff coming down the pipe uh, over the course of the next few weeks as recruiting really cranks up as well. So be sure to check all that stuff out. And once again, thank you for tuning in to Weighing In with Andy Hamilton and David Miracatani. You can download and listen to us on the go through the Matt Talk Podcast Network or check it out on trackwrestling.com if you're already listening to us through iTunes on the Matt Talk Podcast Network. So thank you, David Miracatani, and we will be back next week. is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.